Good evening. Good evening. It is awesome to be gathered with you together in here where it's nice and warm and dry and where we can take a little bit of break from the winter that is coming on. Whenever we get the first snow here, I know it's not the first snow, but, but when the ground is cleared and then snow falls, I, I, can always, I can't help thinking about that line from the Chronicles of Narnia uh, where it's always winter but never Christmas, right? And that's, of course, an analogy of this world, uh, of a world that doesn't know Christ, right? And at the moment that Christ shows up, all of a sudden the long winter is over. And that is what we are anticipating here this evening, is that the long winter did end because Christ came into this world. And so the name of our series during the Sundays and the midweek series has been Stories of the Promise. And we've been trailing this kind of thread of promises that have taken place throughout the Old Testament, starting from, from very close to the beginning all the way up to Christ. But in the midweeks, we've been spoke, uh, focusing especially on special women in the Bible and the Old Testament that are part of this history of the Savior and this history of the promise that was given from Adam and Eve all the way up to the point of Christ. Last week, who did we meditate on? Yeah, Sarah, right? And this week we're going to be meditating on a figure that you probably know very little about, but has a major role in the history and in the coming of Christ. And that's going to be this woman named Rahab, uh, who's not even a Jewish woman, uh, but has this major role to play in your salvation and mine. Special welcome to our guests that we have with us this evening. Everything that we need is right here in the worship folder, except for I think maybe one of the hymns later on will be, uh, you'll need in the red hymnals right there. But we are going to begin on page two with our gathering right, Grant Peace We Pray. Please stand. We begin as we always do in God's house, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And what we're going to do is we're going to sing all four verses of this together, but I'm going to help out our musicians here with the guitar. And so like last week, uh, the oboe is going to be the melody as we sing through this. Son, you 
sent for us. Ah, 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 By faith alone we pray, O Lord. Faith beyond measure sent. Please be seated for our lessons. So all of our lessons, both of our lessons this evening, focus on this character of Rahab, uh, this figure in the Old Testament, but she is also mentioned in the Hall of Heroes in the New Testament very briefly. And so we're going to see that this is a woman of faith in the Lord, and she's kept safe in the middle of some great destruction taking place. Uh, in the midst of Jericho falling, and she's even going to become an heir of Jesus. So our first lesson comes from Joshua chapter 6. If you want to follow along in your Bibles, this is page 185. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her, because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. This is the word of the Lord. And our second lesson comes from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 31 in the New Testament. This is that section from the Hall of Heroes. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. This, too, is the word of the Lord. I invite you now to pick up those red hymnals and to turn to hymn number 24 in the front. And we'll join together in singing the, ang the angel Gabriel from heaven came.
So why do we give gifts at Christmas time? Can you think of the different traditions that we say we get this whole gift giving thing from? What are some of them? What's that? Oh, yes, the three kings, right? So maybe one of the most historic things that we look to is that one of the reasons we give gifts at Christmas time is because the wise men brought gifts to Jesus on that very, well, it wasn't probably the first Christmas. It was probably one or two after that. Uh, but yes, right, uh, early on, the, the gifts of frankincense, incense, and myrrh. Good. Other traditions? What's that? Yeah, Jesus was a gift. Yeah, good. Um, and so Luther, he introduced a kind of new type of figure, the childkin or the uh, Christkind. Have you heard of this before? This is what Germans largely celebrate. They don't talk about Santa coming. They don't talk about uh, Kris Kringle. Instead, they talk about the Christkind, which is German for the Christ child. And so Luther introduced this idea of, of this kind of little child that comes and brings gifts at Christmas, that that's what you should maybe be focusing on instead of uh, an old man with a white beard, um, to especially reflect the idea of Christ bringing gifts into this world, right? The Christ child bringing gifts. Good. Other ones? Yeah. St. Nicholas. Yeah, right. So St. Nicholas, do you know how old St. Nicholas is? Fourth century, fourth century AD. And so the story that makes him most well-known, as far as what we can tell historically, was that, uh, there, that he saved three girls that were, uh, that he saved three girls from having to go into a life of prostitution by bringing bags of gold to their house every day and dropping it through a window. So that's the original story of St. Nicholas. He's also known legend, and through legend as being imprisoned for slapping Arius, uh, which was for you historical buffs, uh, kind of interesting. So there's St. Nicholas, right, who we get some of the idea of Santa Claus from, right? Anyone else? In England, it's Father Christmas, and Father Christmas, as far as anthropology goes, doesn't seem to be rooted in any historical figure at all. It's not as if it came out of any tradition, but instead is this just kind of figure that personifies Christian that got started during kind of the Victorian time in England, or popularized then anyways. So there's all these different stories that we lean on to kind of explain why we give gifts, particularly in Christmas time. I'd like to maybe start a new thought in your head. Not Santa Claus, not Saint Nicholas, not Father Christmas, not the Christkin, uh, or the three wise men, but Rahab the prostitute. And not necessarily her bringing gifts, but maybe one of the best explanations or a very good explanation for why we especially think of Christ and bringing gifts. I think we could meditate on Rahab. So this is the story of Rahab. Israel is at the door of Canaan. They have just come out of Egypt. They have gone through the Red Seas. They have conquered many foes on the way to the Promised Land, and now they are finally there. But there's really two stories that are taking place here. One is Israel returning to their homeland, but the other story that's taking place is that the land of Canaan is now under God's judgment, and Israel is going to be God's tool for bringing judgment on Canaan. Because the Canaanites were an especially vile and corrupt nation in antiquity. So they had everything from idol worship to slavery to temple prostitution to child sacrifice that had been taking place in this country for hundreds of years. And for hundreds of years, God had given Canaan time to repent and time to change, but eventually that time ran out and God can't let vileness and evil flourish forever. And so he was bringing in the Israelites to finally put an end to the child sacrifice and the slavery and the other evils in this land. And so the general Joshua is bringing Israel into Canaan and he sends two spies out to do military reconnaissance. And the very first city that they are going to attack is going to be the city of Jericho. Jericho known for its great fortified walls that go about it. 
And so the two spies sneak into Jericho. Now Jericho is on red alert because they know that the Israelites are on their way coming in. And so the spies can't go to the hotels, they can't go to any of the bars, the common areas, because they know that people are on the lookout for them. So instead, what they do is they find this prostitute that's working out of her home. And on top of this, the home of the prostitute is built right into the walls of Jericho itself. And so this is where they hide out in their time while they're there. Somehow, the spies entering into Jericho, it doesn't go unnoticed. And so the king of Jericho tells uh, a manhunt to take place, to go into Jericho and to search out the different places. And they even know that these spies had stopped at some point at the house of Rahab. And so the spies go, and so the guards go to Rahab's house, and they pound on the door. And as they come, Rahab takes the spies, and she hides them on her roof. Now the roof, roofs of houses back then were flat, and they were used for doing lots of things up on that top in this kind of broad open space. And so she had a bunch of flax that was drying out there, a bunch of basically grass that was drying on the top. And so she hid them in there like two people hiding in a bale of hay. And the guards knock on the door, and Rahab answers the door, and she says, yeah, they were here, but I didn't know who they were. They've taken off now. They left right before the gates were about to close. If you run right now, you should be able to catch up with them. And so the guards then take off to look for the spies elsewhere. Rahab goes up to the roof, and she speaks to the two spies up there. She says, I know who you are. Or better yet, I know who your God is. He's that one that parted the Red Seas. He's the one that defeated all of your enemies on the way over to here. I know this Yahweh. And she uses the name Yahweh. I know this Yahweh who takes care of you. I want him to be my God too. The people of this city are terrified of him. And the truth is, I'm pretty scared as well. But he's shown love to you. Maybe he can show love to me too. I know I don't deserve it. The spies probably said back to her, we know that we don't deserve him either. We don't deserve his mercy. No one does. But we can see already that you have put your trust in him and his love and his protection. And Rahab says to them, when you come back with your armies, spare me. Please spare me and my family just as I've spared you. And they say back to her, literally, our life for yours, even to death. Then she lets them out of her window in the wall there, right into the night, and the spies disappear into the darkness. So imagine you're Rahab now. And you're waiting and waiting for several days until finally that day comes when on the horizon the armies of Israel come and they set up camp. And then one morning they line up and they start making them their way towards the city of Jericho, towards the walls, except they're not in any type of attack formation. Instead, they begin to start marching around the walls of Jericho. And at the front of the marching, are priests that are holding this box that have two angels on the top making a kind of throne, except there's no one sitting on this throne. And the priests, they have these ram's horns that are with them. And they march around the city, and that's all they do. And then you go back to sleep. And the next morning, Rahab wakes up, and there they are marching again around the city of Jerusalem. And then they stop. And it happens again. And again, for six days, they just march around the city until that seventh day, they start marching one more time, except this time there is an eerie silence that has fallen over everything. And as those priests make their way, not just once, but seven times on this last day, they raise those ram horns and they blow on those ram's horns. And as they blow, Rahab probably brings her family together and they begin to feel the earth shake. They begin to hear stones splitting and an earthquake taking place and this violent tremor that runs throughout the city. And then it stops. 
And then she looks out the window, and all the walls have been reduced to dust, except for hers, where her home is. Now the army of Israel comes, an army bent on destroying the vile evil of the Canaanites, those idol worshipers and slavers and devisers of temple prostitution and child sacrifice. But Rahab the prostitute is not frightened because this Israel does not come in as her judge, but as her savior to bring her into a new family and into a new future. So that's the story that we have that's laid before us in scripture. Rahab is a singular character, not only in world history, not only in her life, in this part anyways, that's filled with all this drama and spies and heroism and warfare, but she's also a singular figure in history, in salvation history. God chose her to play a very special role in you and me getting to know Jesus. But despite how unique she is, I can't help relating to her. And maybe I can convince you to relate to her as well. See, Rahab deserved nothing good from God. In fact, she deserved the exact opposite. On the one hand, she was a Canaanite. The legacy of her people was one of idol worship and slavery and child sacrifice. Are, and are where we come from any different? How do we compare to the nation of Canaan? Our culture, is it one of idol worship? Not physically, but it's definitely one of material idol worship, right, of commercial idol worship. The most Christians will spend more on Christmas this year, on just this month of Christmas, more money on presents this month than on their entire year's worth of offerings and charity work. Maybe check to see how that resonates with your pocketbook. The reality is that not only believers struggle with the idols of money. You and I do too, and in a mighty way. Canaanite was a culture of slavery. Are we a culture of slavery? Well, we don't have a caste system of slaves, but we still are a culture of castes in many ways. As diverse as Canada is, as diverse as the West generally is, uh, people over the age of 25, statistics tell us, rarely make close friends with people of another culture. We rarely step into the homes of people of other demographics. Are Christians any different? I sure hope so. I sure hope that we're at least better, but we're far from perfect. Maybe ask yourself a similar question. When's the last time you spent time with maybe any of our many refugees in our St. Paul family? Not only unbelievers struggle with a caste system, with a caste mentality, you and I do too, and mightily. Are we a culture of child sacrifice? Well, here we can talk about us literally being a culture of child sacrifice uh, if we're going to talk about maybe abortion, babies being aborted to the gods of convenience or fear or politics. But it's not just the children of abortions who are offered to false gods, is it? Anytime a child loses his or her faith, because the parents don't make it a priority to keep them in contact with the means of grace. What can we say? What can we say? The reality is not only do unbelievers struggle with this, you and I do too, and mightily. And just a spoiler alert, if you ever have had an abortion, Right, or have been part of that. There is free and full forgiveness. Free and full forgiveness. That's for you. Well, so that's Rahab and her culture, right? That's Rahab the Canaanite. I think I can relate to that anyways. What about the fact that she was not just a Canaanite, but a prostitute? And this is highlighted 
in the account. Whether she was a prostitute from her own choice or felt like she was a victim somehow of being pressured or forced into the profession, how do you think she felt before a holy and righteous and sacred God that saw the human body and sexuality as a sacred and holy gift? How do you think she felt? Is there something we can relate to here? Have you ever felt dirty before God? because of what you've done, maybe habitually. Maybe you feel powerless, that you've been pressured or forced into it. Maybe you feel addicted or trapped, but you know that that doesn't change what it is. Not only Rahab struggled with the feeling of being corrupt and ugly before God. You and I do too. You and I do too, and in a mighty way. But that is not where the account of Rahab stops. And that's not where your story stops either. Because God simply didn't forgive Rahab. We know that that's coming. That her sins are fully forgiven before God. He didn't just simply forgive her. He transformed her. This Rahab the Canaanite, who was a member of this vile community of idol worship and slavery and child sacrifice, he brought her out and into a brand new family, and not just any family, he brought her into his family. Her sins weren't just wiped clean. She became holy in God's sight. And she became a daughter of God, clothed in righteousness. When God looked at her, he saw someone innocent of all those sins, and more than that, someone that loves God perfectly and loves humanity perfectly. That's what he made her into. Now, how can a God of justice do this, right? It seems unjust to overlook all of this. How can a God of justice pull this off? Because of a promise that he made to humankind. A promise that Israel specifically was created to protect. God was going to send a savior. Someone who would carry out the full sentence of the punishment that we deserve to carry it fully upon himself and to give Rahab and us his innocent life. And so Rahab the Canaanite wasn't just transformed into Rahab the child of God, but Rahab the prostitute was changed into Rahab the mother of God. This part's kind of mind-blowing. The reason we're reading about her today is not because we have these few couple chapters in her life with this undesirable occupation. The reason we're reading is because of the chapters that are going to follow. Rahab is going to marry a man, a Jewish man, named Salmon. And Rahab and Salmon will be the great grandparents of a shepherd that is going to slay a giant, that is going to become a great king, and who's going to write the largest amount of the Old Testament. Rahab is the great-great-grandmother of King David. And the most important part about King David is not what he accomplishes, but who comes from the line of King David. Jesus. Rahab carries the bloodline of the Savior of the world. You and I are transformed as well. We're no longer members of our sinful culture, but we have been brought into a brand new family where we are now all fully children of God. How? Through Jesus giving us this perfect life in the exact same way that perfect life was promised to Rahab. And maybe we're not transformed into the mother of God, but we are transformed. We've been transformed into the hands and the feet of God and Jesus in this world. And he uses us, just like he used Rahab, he uses us for the saving of souls. Rahab deserved nothing, but she gained absolutely everything. She was as dishonorable as you could possibly imagine, but could you imagine someone with more honor in the Bible? The same with you. You deserve nothing. You were given absolutely everything. Maybe you look back at your life and you feel at times deeply dishonorable. 
But could you have been more honored by God when you were made his child and brought into his family? You're his holy, precious child. You're his representative in this world. So we're going to say why we give gifts, right? What, what does this have to do with Rahab the prostitute? Well, way before St. Nick, thousands of years before St. Nick, uh, and before uh, uh, Chris Kringle and Father Christmas and the wise men and all of them, way before all of them, in fact, 1,400 years before even the very first Christmas, already Christians thought of God as the ultimate gift giver. 1,400 years before that first Christmas, Rahab received the same gift that you and I have received 2,000 years after that first Christmas. New life, salvation, free and full forgiveness. And God turned her into the ultimate gift giver, the great-grandmother of Jesus, a gift you and I get. And we get that one-time gift of that life paid for on the cross once in history so we can look back with certainty on event that has paid for it all. But then also the gift that we get every single day when we open up to our Savior and we hear those words, you are forgiven. And so this Christmas, I want to challenge you to remember Rahab. Remember how God remembered her and how his remembering her was really him remembering you. Amen. Please stand. And may the peace of God that transcends all human understanding may dwell richly in your hearts and in your minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. At this time we got an opportunity to give our offerings to the Lord, some of our first fruits. Uh, if you're a guest with us today, do not feel like you need to put anything in that offering basket. That is a way that we, our St. Paul Church family, how we not only give to our God, but how we also support the work that we do here in our community and throughout the rest of the world. But if you could, pick up those friendship registers and fill those out and pass them down. That would be fantastic. Thank you. And at this time, if you would, let's turn to page four, and we'll join together in our responsive Advent prayer found there. Please stand. We pray. Eternal Father, throughout the centuries, you repeated and affirmed your promise to send the offspring of the woman to crush the serpent's head. Through your prophets of old, you continually directed the eyes of your people to the advent of their Savior. We praise you, O Lord, for keeping your promise and sending your Son to destroy the works of the devil. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of our King, use your mighty word to shatter our pride and to rouse us from spiritual slumber and apathy. Move us to take to heart the words of John. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You sent your Son to redeem us from sin. Let this good news be our joy and strength. Use it to cheer the lonely, encourage the fearful, and give hope to the despairing. In these days before Christmas, spare us from the stress of deadlines and the frenzy of commercialism. Fill our lives with the message of your peace 
in the music of your grace. Direct our eyes not only to the manger, but also to the skies, where we will see your Son coming again, not as a lowly child, but as the Lord of Lords. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, in your grace, in your power, and in your glory. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we'll remain standing for our closing prayers and blessings on page five. Now rest beneath night shadows the woodland field and meadow the world in slumber but you, my heart, awaken with prayer and song be taken. Let praise to your Creator rise. Almighty God, grant to your church the Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes from above. Let nothing hinder your word from being freely proclaimed to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, so that we may serve you in steadfast faith and confess your name as long as we live. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated. We'll continue with our final hymn in the uh, worship folder, or in the uh, hymnals, in the red hymnals, hymn number 53, the Christmas hymn to shepherds as they watched by night.
Amen. Once again, good evening. It's a joy to get an opportunity to take this break in the middle of the week with you and to leave all of our problems, all of our difficulties, uh, maybe any guilt that we might have. Just We just get to leave it all at the cross and you get to leave out here just confirm that you are forgiven. You are a holy, precious child of God in his sight. Uh, I don't have any announcements other than to remind you that next week, uh, next week we, we have another worship service, our last Advent one. And so at six, we will have our soup and sandwich downstairs. Today, it was the teens that helped run the meal. Next week, it will be a lot of the university kids from our Illuminate. So be sure to come then as well so that you can meet some of the kids that have benefited greatly from your support and your desserts and things like that that are very looking forward to thanking you for that as well. Uh, anything else? Yes, Evelyn. Yes. Yeah. What day? What day is today? The eleventh. All right. Let's pray for Annie right now. Huh? Heavenly Father, God of might and power, this God that not only created the world with your words, but also with your words brought into it your promises of full sins forgiven through Jesus. We thank you for entering into history and giving us the greatest gift of all, making us your children through the blood of Christ. We pray that you be with Annie as she goes over to Africa and as she spends time doing just that, sharing your words of salvation uh, in refugee camps and in orphanages. And we just pray that your protective hand is over her. We pray that you guard her and her kids with your guardian angels, that you watch over uh, the children that she interacts with and the ones that gather together for their Christmas dinners. We pray that all the shoes that are going over there, that they get to the kids that need them, as well as the Bibles and the tracts and everything else that they get taken advantage of so that, Lord, your word can be known, that sins are forgiven through what you've done. We pray especially uh, that the work that we have committed to you that as you promised, you will work it out to all the good of those who love you. We pray that you remind Annie and her kids that you will never leave her or forsake her and that you're working all things out for her good because she is your precious child. Thank you for the greatest Christmas gifts that you can give us. In your name we pray, amen. With that, God's blessings on the rest of your week. We'll see you this Sunday at the foot of the cross.